Hello everyone, today we talk about Bernard de Clairvaux and the Cluniac and Cistercian aesthetics. So, the Gregorian reform, as we have seen in, in a dedicated playlist on Schwerpunkt, we made so many videos about it, was a strongly polemic movement towards the ecclesiastical structures and the customs of the clergy. The mundanization of the role and the action of the clergy constituted an object of reflection uh, already before the end of the 11th century when the Gregorian reform takes shape um, that um, especially among those intellectuals that nourished a strong desire of redemption and at the same time of autonomy um, with the aim to correct uh, if you want the decline the degeneration, the perceived decline the generation of the function of the clergy and the monks and also in order to re-establish the common opinion of the certainty of the coincidence between the primitive and the, the actual, the contemporary church. So, as you, you understand, uh, these are deep um, reflections that have to do with the, the role of the same church and of course of the clergy from its own very side right the, the in in medieval so high medieval society that in fact was perceived from within the same clergy right also because uh, the clergy was at the time basically the only uh, social class to, to be educated uh, to be literate uh, let's say um, and, and and therefore um, this th the fact that this feelings that this perception that this realization came from th within the same church was definitely very important because from one side it was sparked naturally by a reflection um, theological studies um, it was supported by it all along but at the same time it was political and it had to do naturally also with the uh, expansion of the clergy and its power um, in, in this specific period in which, of course, the, the whole Europe was growing and expanding, right, and therefore trying to carve also a certain autonomy within the mm, political and social institutions that, you know, at the time, you know, the clergy had a lot of uh, privileges, of immunities, uh, it was not like, uh, you know, a community like all the other, right, uh, it was protected, it had a uh, first role, um, and it was important because also great part in fact of the intellectuals that were needed so strongly needed even by the emperors by the kings came from the clergy so uh, we have talked a lot actually on Schwerpunkt if you go into the medieval society playlist also in, in medieval Christianity uh, there's plenty of that the relation between um, imperium and sacerdotium right you know and the the empire and, and the church and not just as a struggle but also and, and, uh, and often as a cooperation as a matter of fact that um, in, entailed however two separated dimensions of action to uh, also two different purposes generally speaking you know one ideally respectively devoted to you know to, to government to uh, justice uh, to to war right uh, the other um, to spiritual life the, the, the uh, imitatio Christi and um, and also other activities that in included in fact education uh, aiding the poor um, <coughs> etc and, and sometimes the actually th these two parts overlapped they weren't completely uh, separated and in fact that was the reason why the St. Gregorian reforms had brought forward this need for defining better what the boundaries of uh, the, the, the empire and, and the church actually were uh, within the, 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 the societas cristiana, given that, of course, they were overlapping within the Christian society as such, but um, more specifically, the criticism towards the ecclesiastical hierarchies came from those who also were concerned from within the same hierarchies of uh, public, let's say, secular interference, right? So today we won't be talking about that, but this is the, the general background you have to, to bear in mind. So the hub of this m movement uh, of reformation um, was the, in fact, the Burgundian Abbey of Cluny. And yet we have to remember that Cluny was not the only place where this objective was uh, pursued. In fact, 
the coming back to the origins, or better, the origin proper, because uh, every a reformer, uh, its main, um, let's say, currents had their own, all their own view about this. There were uh, reforms and, and counter reforms that also sparked um, competition among the the same orders. In fact, the Cluniax, the, the Cistercians, are an example of this because uh, there was also the provision of the same Benedict, uh, the, the interpretation, let's say, of the Benedictine rule, what it actually meant. Um, and at, at this time, as you know, the the world. Mm, the, all the monks actually believed to be Benedictines. There was no other distinction. There were not other rules proper, but there were different interpretations, and around these, naturally different political directions, and even cer certain different orders, uh, as as you understand. So the origin, in, in this sense, was uh, each time presented and justified in a different manner, right? And this is basically the leitmotif of. A great part, especially of the 12th century, that was one of the most fervid in European history from the, the artistical and cultural point of view. That's why, in fact, aesthetics, especially in architecture, was, was so important this time because um, it, it was really not just a, a reform, it was also a matter of creating something new, new models, new uh, new prototypes, if you want, that had were you know ever more consciously um, modeled on different theological views and think about the difference between the Romanesque and the Gothic architectures, right? All beautiful in their own regard, they have to be contextualized, in fact, uh, in, in this sense for the peculiar meaning, but think how uh, different they are and how different the, the whole message that revolves around them uh, actually is, or maybe uh, not much the message in itself, but the way it's delivered, right? And And this also strongly and and truly aesthetic, like an em emotional, sentimental um, approach to to the faithful. Also, um, and so, so this is very very important to bear in mind. And and exactly because um, this aspiration was so general, right? A, a, a reform was so general. It assumed, as we just said, different faces and aspects, right? In Cluny, for example, the the will uh, to come back to the primitive Benedictine rule was, was translated quite soon in a deep sort of li liturgization of monastic life um, and the, the life of the monks was rigidly uh, regulated and the disposition of the monastery itself reflected the uh, in turn, the or organizational needs of such liturgical life that had it was very scant. Like um, uh, even the, the 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 buildings, the spaces were all conceived to, to be more functional in order for for the monks to 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 um, compel, let's say, wi with these rules. And this assumed a particularly important dimension, also because the number of the monks kept to grow continuously, right and this is not just about uh, cultural you, cultural orientations and spiritual sensitivities. This is literally about the fact that these uh, abbeys uh, um, had an enormous amount of land, hence of wealth. A lot of people went living in there, um, in uh, as monks, of course. In that, that was a, a, a you know life choice, but also sometimes an investment, literally. And uh, the whole thing now was new because such uh, amount of wealth in you know in the previous centuries in Europe had, had never existed so now there were new organizational problems that were met a bit everywhere but that from a monastic point of view had also to be you know justified and uh, regulated on uh, you know calibrated let's say better uh, and and more sophisticatedly in a more sophisticated way on the base of the rule right so the the first um, let's say, uh, first of all, mm, the the grandiosity of think of, of Cluny. You know, the, the first abbatial church, about which we, we know nothing, it was built at the beginning of the tenth century. Was was mm, substituted. You know, from the mid of the same century, actually, was built the so-called Cluny the second. That was a you know an already very large 
church which has uh, three naves, a transept, and a great choir, um, to the to the model which w were eventually inspired many other buildings, not just in Burgundy, um, in in the various you know detachments of of the also of the all the various Cluniac outbase, but also in other regions of France and of today's Switzerland. But it was especially in Cluny the third that was built from the mid, uh, let's say, from from the mid of the, the 11th century for the will of the great abbot uh, Hag, uh, Jug, sorry, um, he was elected in 1049 when he was 25 years old and he would remain at the government of the abbey up to 1109, right? So this uh, enormous figures in the history of, 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 of European monasticism that event would eventually represent the greatness of the order, right? Then Cluny the Third was actually built to r r compete by <coughs> dimension with nonetheless then Saint Peter's in Vatican with five naves and a great uh, choir and um, the ambulatory, and it, it was um, further enlarged I during the 12th century by the abbot. Peter the Venerable, up to measure, uh, up to measuring 220 feet of length, that is surpassing de facto the dimensions of the Vatican Basilica. At the beginning of the 12th century, uh, from Cluny, the mother house depended uh, roughly 1,000 monasteries all over Europe. Do you realize what it means? I mean, you have now uh, a state within the, you know, the, the the same church within the same monarchy well, of the territories. This was scattered mostly the one of France, of course, and but but not only because mm, it, it, this was actually scattered everywhere, and the the assets of of, of this order were immense, uh, as much as it's you know its own political power at this point and and just think of what it means to organize it you you need an administration you you need something that goes beyond just you know a rule you need an ideology you need a model right the the cluniac cardinals at this point were extremely powerful they constituted a uh, very strong group within the same roman curia some of them actually became popes themselves such as urban ii 1088 1099 that was the Pope that preached the, the the Crusade, right, for the first time? And um, de facto, the Cluniac Order uh, was um, passing. Uh, it was had taken the same path, but uh, in kind of a different way of the riches and earthly power for fighting which it had been born. Like it kind of, it's kind of ironic, right? In fact. That's when Cistercians and other groups had started to, to criticize the, the, the order itself because it was extremely wealthy. You know, uh, before Cluny, uh, Benedictine monks were kind of um, criticized because they ate um, uh, meat, for example, during the prohibited uh, days. And, uh, you know, it was said now that the Cluniac um, monks would actually eat. Um, uh, only fish during those days, but enormous carbs, very fat, and and um, you know with all the the most mm, delicious uh, oils and and garments, you know, and and that's what you know with with within an extreme luxury. Because by the way, these uh, like Cluny monas monasticism is it was an aristocratic one, substantially. It had a lot of extremely especially in the same hierarchy in the, the monastic hierarchy were extremely powerful people um, powerful uh, at all levels of society and also by extraction so that it, it would become uh, normal like for, for them to, to be extracted from noble families and to make this outstanding careers within a church by the way that was becoming increasingly hierarchical at this very point we made a video on the dawn of papal monarchy, for example, where we talk, well, not specifically about the structuration of the clergy, but making you understand what, with the Gregorian reform, 
reforms, let's say better, um, the, the Church of Rome had become and how these monastic orders were participating essentially to its strengthening. So the Gregorian reform was, first of all, the, there's this clash for investors, about which we have made several videos now, and the um, that represents kind of the most, uh, the, the investor controversy, and uh, it's kind of a, some of the most famous uh, chapters in this sense, but wh what is often overlooked was is what happened later, and especially, I mean, after it. Um, with the conquered date of Worms in 1122, the church now, yes, had kind of won in some regard, especially in Italy, its own um, its own place, its own prerogatives. But now there were immense problems. The so 12th century was the century of the great heresies in Western Europe. But there was a time in which the Roman Church was about to be overrun, and and the answer was a structuration. So actually the relation between th the papacy and these orders was vital for achieving that because um, these powers were representing yes now kind of a, a principates on their own uh, but at the same time they were necessary for having a realistic control of the church especially in a world where uh, you know the, the investiture controversy was a real thing because you know it wasn't just a matter of, of faith or or theological interpretations, it was a matter of essentially of territorial dominions. Like the, the, the Church of Rome had an enormous power, had a lot of lands in central Italy, and um, and, and these other mm, orders also were. By the way, the the the, the opposition between the uh, the bishops, like the ecclesiastical hierarchy proper, and the the monks was was a thing was also exploited by the Church of Rome because many bishops actually uh, were you know albeit very jealous of their own prerogatives um, at a local level they they usually sided with the monarchies like in France or in Germany um, also in England but uh, at least usually um, and uh, the monasteries were instead something different they were something if you want more radical. Uh, conceptually speaking, because you know the ecclesiastical hierarchies were a bit more compromising. They they effectively had a real secular um, domination. The the monastic orders had, but the 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 the, the concept, the ideology that revolves around the monastery is effectively the uh, you know the opposition to the secular world as such. That is to say, not that these powers were isolated from the real world. But that um, they they aimed theoretically at transforming the world into a monastery, literally. I mean, th this is in a nutshell what monasticism, since the, the earliest origins in, in ancient times, actually was about uh, in in Christianity. It was really the idea that every Christian should follow a s essentially a monastic rule. What Pretty the imitation of Christ because that's what it is at the end of the day, uh, with all the, the various variations. Let's say the Benedictine rule is very particular. Th the Western monasticism had a very different sensitivity uh, from the the Eastern one, for example. But still, that was the idea, and and um, the fact that the reforming papacy had insisted on the purification. Uh, of the clergy and uh, of of the excuse me uh, yeah of the church I mean the fact of the church from um, secular interference is actually coupled was coupled very well ideologically speaking with the monastic instances that were more radical by by standard right in its in, in their own aim like uh, a political and social model bishops were something very different bishops were quite mundane individuals that uh, also had for necessarily a mundane life you know you can't be a bishop and not having a mundane life you live into a city you have to organize a diocese you know that's how you live uh, monks are different but at the same time they also start developing their own power in their own regard and they find into the roman church a great ally so there is no surprise of how powerful Cluny had become and uh, why it eventually was also criticized because you know the church had to be uh, you know the the Christian world has to be administered in some way. It can be a bit about faith, but uh, in order to rule one thousand monasteries, you you need more than that. Yeah, you need practical means, and these were evidently there for 
the same fact of having some much amount of, of, of land, right? And uh, the, uh, by the way, th this power was accumulating, was not like feudal powers that could evaporate in practice through genealogical, uh, you know, events, you know, it, it could Mm, and splits and uh, inheritances, etc. Th these things were keeping to evolve dramatically, like th they were starting being bigger and bigger, right? Uh, so, uh, aside from this, um, in um, the mm, the the order, uh, let's say, from from within, actually, the same Cluniac Burgundy had gone developing another movement of religious reform, uh, religious and monastic reform. In 1098, Robert de Molesme, there was a Cluniac monk himself, abandoned the Abbey of Cluny. And he went to found another one, Cito. Hmm? From the Latin name of this one, Cistercium, derived the one of the new Cistercian order, the government of which was assumed in 1113 by a personality of exceptional uh, caliber, that is in fact Bernard de Clairvaux. Hmm? Um, of, mm, you know, about Bernard, we, we can't say a, a lot of things, like we can say that he was a um, political as well as a religious reformer, a defender of, of a defender of the church and also a solver of the schism that was a quite a big deal for uh, as you understand at the time and he was a man of um, purist and reforming passion in the truest um, you know fashion and and often he was also kind of fanatic in, in his in, in his own ideals because you know you can't be so radical if you if you don't exceed even ideologically, and um, he had always this um, orator, um, let's say, orational emphasis, um, and these projects of immense uh, scale, uh, he had an exceptional personality which left a great mark, especially in the aesthetical sensitivity of the Middle Ages, as we will see today. And from one side. Uh, in fact, he prescribed certain very, you know, meticulous rules to the the, the planners, the the architects of of the Cistercian monasteries. These that had uh, always to be founded on in isolated areas, mm, even marshy ones, and therefore to to reclaim because you know that. Um, this was the idea of the ori of the original monastery that had to be built far away, like in places that you know were not monasticism didn't entail actually no contact with the outside, as it's often said. You know, the the, the monastery had necessarily to communicate with the outer side in in some way because it had to to constitute a, a model of imitation by the rest of the Christians. But it had to be uh, in, in, into an isolated area for, for the same monks to live in, in kind of the wilderness. So, kind of uh, reproducing the uh, the setting where you know Jesus had gone you know, in the desert, you know, in this ascetic uh, phase of the uh, in, uh, of his earthly journey, he did you know. So th that was the, the monasticism had to, to be practically about, even though, of course, even the uh, the Cistercian monasteries were not, you know, huts or play, you know, the, the words, but th they still had, um, there was all a, a meaning, by the way, um, a symbolism related to certain uh, landscapes, to certain areas, you know, if you look, at, there are very interesting studies about the semantics and the etymology of, um, even in the encyclopedic, uh, encyclopedic, um, world of the Middle Ages, of what actually meant uh, the term as ballet uh, or mountain or forest, like, you know, the symbolisms, you know, if you read this, uh, usually the, the point of reference was, of course, Isidore of Seville, that was the the, the, encyclopedi the Christian encyclopedist of the Middle Ages, pro-excellence, 
and um, and a lot of studies revolving around this. So there was even, a, in fact, a, a spatial dimension, and this is why also aesthetics derive what aesthetics derive from in this context, right? Um, and even within the same monastery, of course, uh, the Cistercian order hadn't lost the Cluniac uh, interest for a functional distribution of the of the various uh, buildings, the church, the the dormitory. Uh, the refectory, the the grange, that is this b rural buildings that were also very important because they, uh, you know, they produced a lot. The the Cistercians had uh, revived, in fact, the emphasis on the of manual work, right? Unlike the Cluniacs, as as at least they 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 criticized them for, so that they had to produce. Like a lot of European economy in this century was boosted by the succession order. The other day we were, t the other day, like two weeks ago now, uh, uh, even more, we were talking about the crusader horses, uh, war horses that were bred in, in Europe that were exported largely from Cistercian uh, monasteries, which is quite interesting also because the Cistercians were not like military orders. They 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 were a simple order, but they they provided this f the the finest sometimes. And think of the immense wealth um, of such, uh, you know, of for for producing such goods, for example. And in all these buildings was scanned the the daily life of the monks that were rigor uh, rigorously divided amidst. Uh, the areas reserved to these ones and, and the ones instead deputed to the lay brothers uh, that is those laymen that worked actually in an almost servile mm, fashion in into the abbey and for the abbey right so it, this is interesting because it kind of parallels the same feudalism in, in many ways and it, it's not that there were many other forms of political and social organization at the time in order to, to, to actually make some, some concrete difference. So, um, in, in the colonial, uh, the Cistercian order soon rose to, to, to immense power itself. And um, especially the exploitation of the squads of lay brothers was, was very intensive. Like, the, there was um, uh, a commitment in imposed to the monks to uh, to leave uh, the abbey of belonging as soon as the number of its own members had reached uh, pre-established limited limit sorry and this was very important because you, you can understand the affiliation here so that they had to go find a, a new monastery and this entailed naturally needs of constructive rapidity and efficiency for which we can talk even about proto-industrial levels right and, and this is also clear from those principles of absolute simplicity in geometrism and modular modular rep mm, reproductibility that um, of this buildings that stemmed not just from the w the aesthetic will of Bernard but also from the practical needs of what we could mm, call as a Cistercian lifestyle and, and so the, the couple of works in which Bernard expressed his ideas relatively to this migratory lifestyle of you know, creating new monasteries uh, every time they that were technically always the same one conceptually, right? Because the the monastery is the it would be theoretically, uh, ideally, the the r reproduction on earth of the heavenly uh, Jerusalem, right? So expanding building other monasteries is not like building separate monasteries because it's as if the monastery was always one. Uh, ideally, even of course, if <laughs> every order kind of thought, no, we are the right one, the other. So that's why also the the, the battle about the rules, uh, the Benedictine rule and its interpretation and its application, let's say better, because that was the real problem uh, at the end of the day, how to regulate the life of these people stemmed from. But uh, so 
there are practical needs. This is what I would like to make you understand. They, they are of building, of architectural nature. In order to build so many of these monasteries uh, very quickly, right? And it's very meaningful the same Bernard at his time was taking care of these problems because even in Cleta were of dramatic importance for the same development of the order at the time. And um, according to him, like Bernard wrote almost a, a manifesto of Cistercian aesthetics. Uh, according to him, all the true Christians um, should actually, uh, in fact, uh, adhere to this monastic model. He built in, in complexively one of the most known texts of all the medieval uh, Latin uh, literature and I it's two letters of which the second and the most important written in 1125 circa is addressed to the friend and abbot William of Saint-Thierry Saint uh, Guillaume de Saint-Thierry and this is the so-called Apologia ad Guilelmum uh, apology to uh, William, um, that more than a private letter seems actually uh, an open letter in the modern sense of the term, that is a document that very far from representing a kind of a moment of epistolar exchange between the two friends, actually wants to be a public text proclaiming principles that wish to, to aspire to become universal for all Christians, right? In the tone, the literary uh, style are intensely and most culturally rhetorical, in fact. Um, and, and therefore, this was a document destined to, uh, to a very educated public that was the same one of the, of, of the monasteries, largely. And, and the tone um, like itself, for example, no word is, is random in here. Uh, but it, it, on the contrary, it results to be framed into this kind of iron, um, f steady structure um, and of a period that is permanently chasmic in tendency and that is, it, it, mm, it uses phrases and uh, concepts that um, are kind of intertwined, uh, crossed and answering by counterposition, right? And the salient and emotionally crucial points of his reasoning are underlined by the interrogative form of the phrase that requires and uh, demands uh, directly the sense of the interlocutor that um, find himself in metaphorically speaking in front of a of a wall like we you know he's obliged to to accept either the, the increasing through a saint or nothing, right? And in this frame, the, uh, the, the description of the figurative world that surrounds the Christian assumes kind of dark tones. And there is the invitation of Bernard to, you know, to beware um, and from it. And, and, and it, it becomes a sort of moral, moral crusade. The luxury uh, and the richness of the objects and the ornaments are unacceptable from the side of the church and of the true Christian that have to give the precedence to the needs of the poor and also they have to be concentrated on on the salvation not on earthly pleasure. Bernard's oration hits especially the churches. He says that uh, he doesn't even mention the immense height of the oratories, the um, excessive uh, uh, length and the exaggerated width, the luxurious ornamentation and the paintings that draw the attention. They attract the sight of, of, of the believers that pray and, and basically prevent them from concentrating. The precious objects, the reliquaries, for example, uh, are described in this uh, terms. The, the eyes are 
wounded by the relics covered in gold. Right? The saints have beautiful forms that um, make them, you know, considering kind of even more saints, as if, you know, he's ironic in this sense, because everybody comes to kiss them, right? And therefore, um, uh, the, the believers make more offers in, in money. The beauty is admired more than what the, the true sacred is venerated. And in, in the churches, there are not even crowns, but even uh, wheels uh, full with, with lamps that um, are shine even more because of the precious stones that are nestled into them. And in the end, there is the most famous criticism that hits especially the Romanesque uh, imaginary, right? The one of the, the that mm, figurative um, fantasy world that is populated by figures of men, animals, monsters um, that are either you know hyper or sub real, right? And put in on the scene on mm, codexes and, and capitals with a with a with such a freedom that is at that seems to be borderline with with m Christian spirituality because he says what what does wha what is there on in, in the clusters under the eyes of the friars that read this monstrous ridiculous um, and um, beautiful deformity this uh, kind of a full obscene monkey and this ferocious lions, this monstrous uh, centauri, this half man, right? These tigers, the spotted tigers, these soldiers that fight. This is also pretty interesting. Uh, you know why? And uh, the, these hunters that also uh, blow the, the horn and under a head there are multiple bodies and vice versa uh, one body has multiple heads here there is a qu uh, quadruped with the tail of a snake and a fish with the head of a quadruped here a beast that in the front I is a horse and in the back is a, is a goat and here and there a horned animal that in the rear is a horse and the marvelous variety of such forms um, of the forms is such that it becomes much more pleasant reading the marbles than the books right in that um, you can pass more easily you can spend more easily the day at by admiring all of this than meditating on the law of God right and, and, and don't think that this is just rhetorical meaning that um, you you have to think what what the the symbolism actually meant at the time. Um, the the world Europe was emerging essentially and largely from a from a pagan past and also from a Christian world that remi had remained tied to this fundamentally superstitious and kind of uh, vision of the world. Now here we will um, you know the, the fact that there were such figures is is first of all not random like because these probably had always been there you know where in another they were added naturally in this monasteries that these figures were kind of uh, uh, you know they were still referred to biblical episodes but uh, with more poetical license than it was probably necessary and naturally European ha art had developed also around and it would, would keep in part to, to well, maybe you know. At, the, at this point, it starts entering in, in crisis, also because of this uh, questions like, w what are they uh, there for? Like, do are there some? Is there some need? You know, is is there not a higher, a more limpid and linear understanding of the world that we can present? This is really the passage from the Romanesque to the Gothic, as we will see later, and the idea that the a religious model should picture a an uh, a perfe the perfection fundamentally that is emulating the, the the harmony and perfection of the heavens right so romanesque the romanesque world was was in, in a different way it was 
essentially aimed at scaring the the, uh, the believers through the threat of uh, of hell, right? And in, in the 12th century is, is exactly this century that we call of renaissance of humanism, um, just like the one of the end of the Middle Ages, because objectively. The, the human figure in this confidence in understanding the world and not just feeling surrounded by a real a dark reality with monsters and uh, unexplicable figures was w was rising you know was spreading and this is the reflection of it this is this is to be contextualized in, in here so all this mysterious world um, and, and this is and this is 12th century France right um, the, the other regions of of Europe if you take uh, you know, the Gothic, as you know, is um, emerges in northern France and in England, roughly. But certain uh, regions like Germany or Italy still have uh, kind of a it takes some time, or at least the, the spread of Gothic is is imperfect. It still bears the 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 um, the, the, the traces of what, what existed before. So this is the product of a culture that is changing. Of theologic studies that that, inf that France pioneered at the time, and that would produce eventually, especially in the 13th century, its fullest, you know, this perfection of Gothic architecture. Um, even is if it starts in the 12th, but you know, the the, the, the model eventually you know spreads far and wide in the thir uh, 13th. Um, so, uh, in 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 Bernard's critic actually um, it's been seen uh, a direct description of the of Cluny in itself like Cluny was probably full of this figures of these pictures that you can in part in fact already see of the in, in its in the remains of the Abbey like on these capitals etc uh, that were typical of Romanesque architecture so Bernard was making here very cutting remarks and accusations in recognizing this mm, Benedictine community that was rivaled to his and from which he had come himself so that he knew pretty well at this point. Um, so uh, another thing I wanted to say is that all the symbolism that he criticizes actually represent um, um, I don't know if you have ever read or uh, the book or watched the movie of uh, Umberto Eco's *The Name of the Rose*, but that th that's in there also, you know, even in an inspiration to this with the kind of the attempt of suppressing the the curiosity and and that, however, sparks some excitement, some evil in this absolute Christian perspective. So that's very thought-provoking. Because it's as if there was a branch of culture uh, that never actually abandoned such models and that saw in them actually a great uh, richness and wealth, right? But at the same time, there was a kind of a higher and more sophisticated thinking that was, um, in a certain sense, uh, rendering such, uh, you know, such mm, traditional art kind of obsolete. Um, or at least not presentable in certain specific contexts, like the one of scholastics, um, in terms of you know architecture, uh, literature, you know, like in, in in many other worlds, we're, we're you know we're we're transforming. Like th this is really about also the, the the evolution of monarchies and how they they were trying to 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 sacralize the same crown right in the fact that uh, such symbolism albeit belonging to to great traditions because all these monsters all these figures we look at a uh, an heraldic symbol I mean you don't find maybe many monsters but it was still like yeah you, there were actually um, and that was the the ancient past the the ancient idea of mm, tribal connection of of symbolism of um, even of totemism by by a certain degree, but very far in time, that the still permeated uh, society, like the idea of creating something was somewhat completely purified aesthetically speaking by Hartley and low, let's say uh, non-divine political messages was also a way to hire and to justify the um, the 
let's say the, the expanded the empowerment of the elites the fact that we're starting to grow always higher and to distantiate always more even from the rest of the all we're talking about the monarchy we're talking about uh, the uh, the the papacy itself so all this has a very important meaning that uh, reveals a very um, uh, very far seeing you know pol political and cultural theory right this is not a a fashion this is really a a, a project right a political pro religious spiritual a religious project um, however even still talking about Bernard's passage in the Apologia ad Guilhelm um, Bernard referred uh, to in general those uh, what he saw in churches in, in in the clusters of his times right it was not just about Cluny Cluny was a bit the, the, the epitomization of it but um, it was in a certain sense um, th this letter betrays the, the taste of the time and at the same time demoralizing anxiety of Bernard and this even clearly doesn't mean that he didn't like this architecture either. This is to be, uh, this is to be realized. These weren't fanatics in the integralist sense of the world. Like these were fanatics in the sense they were actually people who had a very deep spiritual um, that posed themselves very deep ethical problems. Like this mm, problem of purification was actually an enormous deal at the time. This is what during the 12th century even clash against the heresies. Uh, that existed not just around, uh, but even in in the theological um, um, studies of Paris. Did, we made a video about Hamelric of Bena, for example. And, and you you can see how the attraction for these monsters, etc., uh, revealed actually an, an enormous interest towards nature and its manifestations, etc. But it was still focusing on the um, let's say on the differences not uh, on the synthesis right on the analysis not on the synthesis this is what instead uh, gothic scholastic culture would would had to right so this is this was also the 12th century was a moment of great anxiety right like all the what we have historiographically perceived as moments of renaissance actually these were moments of terrifying anxiety um, it, the, the 12th century, especially, I was saying before, the threat of the heresies, um, the increase of wars, the, the, the was, it was a problem, right? It was a moment of, of great, also revived violence. And um, so Bernard was leading to it and seeing, taking this, you know, mm, uh, creating this Cistercian order in order to, to save the world from for chaos, from chaos and from this um, disorientation that now we, we will understand perhaps a bit better because of course Bernard liked his architecture as well it was part of his own world he had r been living surrounded by it but um, he and, and the proof is that he uh, looks at all these things and looks at them with the eyes of a man of his time but but even more than that, the the one of an extremely sensitive person, because such um, fantastic and monstrous figures that you can spot in a, on a Romanesque uh, capital is, um, you know, is something that that deeply that is deeply fascinating even still today. And the way in the way in which he describes them, he m shows us that he 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 liked them too. He was captivated. He was fascinated by them as well. But uh, that's exactly why he um, recognized in this temptation the same and dangerous um, diabolical forces, right? Or at least something that could disorient the uh, the mind of the Christian from from the most important things in life, right? So uh, it was a subtle and in a clever uh, take on, on these issues. For example, the the half man, the the composite beasts, were not diabolical just because they uh, they were an actual distraction for the monks, 
think about all these monks, you know, maybe the, especially the young ones that arrived there were kind of undisciplined and they were young and, you know, excited about new stuff. And they looked at these capitals and spent, maybe you can't see them, if you're around these clusters, uh, looking at these figures and laughing and questioning, you know, and, and think about this elderly Mo uh, you know, ah, but instead of looking down, ah, this young man is just thinking about uh, art and then this details, and they don't care about the the deep truths of religion, etc. So, uh, in that, uh, in in considering in fact that the forms and and um, in 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 aesthetics of of the secular world gravitated around this art as well. So it it was like saying. Uh, yeah, you know, the, all the things you uh, hear if you were, if were little in, in the 90s or in the 80s, like, ah, all this violence in television, all these young people, they will become violent. It was basically the same thing. Like, And here, it, it kind of, of course, it's not so trivial. There is a, a greater philosophical and aesthetical um, intelligence behind it. And that would produce, in fact, a... a one of the pillars of Western civilization that are Gothic cathedrals, right? So mm, you have to understand the depth of this in in the the uh, the I don't even know how to say that. I think the greatness. I think it's kind of a too banal as a, as a word, but it's really the the greatness that is reflected by the grandiose vision of a, a Gothic cathedral in all of what it embodied, philosophically, politically. Right, we would never actually talked about this stuff, but there, are, but there are there is plenty of beautiful studies about cathedrals, and you you realize that they're basically not even about architecture; they're mostly about philosophy, and not even recent philosophy. There were things from even the Saint Augustine's De Musica, or all this mathematical proportion, all coming from Neoplat Neopythagorism. You know, there is a lot to tell. Today we don't have the time to do it, but just for saying how one might listen to these topics and say, you know, wh what do I care about this? Well, you care, because if you leave, uh, you know, if you go out in a Euro major European city and you pass by a cathedral, you should be know uh, in w why that, that that thing is there. Um, and there is a deep meaning behind it. We have kind of, uh, even, you know, there is all a mythology or this idea that w the Gothic is reconstructed, it's been, uh, of, of course, largely what we see is of what we call Gothic in our skyline is is actually 19th century, it's not medieval. Uh, we have a very few medieval stuff, as a matter of fact, but the point is still the concept stems from those times, and it stems from such principles that still we can study in this works and revealing to us the, the the deep meaning of so much of, of of the roots of our of our civilization. So never underestimate this this things. You might think, oh, this is, a, you know, imagine so people people looking at this video before listening to certain stuff and saying, oh, well, this is just Bernard Clever. Well, wow, it's boring. I want I want knights. I want battles. I want you know. I want the Romans. You know, you have this as well. That that is very important. Not because the the rest is not important. Uh, is evidently we see, and you know, you, you can understand if you follow Schwerpunkt. But um, these are important too, and th and they are kind of more important in relative terms because they are overlooked. Because it's as if you had a, an enormous treasury just next to you, and 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 not understanding that it is a treasure, and that's where love for for knowledge and for for even for art meant in, in, in its broader meaning, uh, not just the, the aesthetics of, of things, but the uh, the art proper, the, the practice, the, you know, the, the material aspect of this story. Like, you, you can't, you can't, um, you can't see a Gothic cathedral wi without thinking of a Cistercian Grange, because the wealth to make a Gothic cathedral came from, from the Cistercians as well, right? So, Never think like uh, we will concentrate on monuments. And this is we we measured the uh, the greatness of a civilization through the monuments and in the monuments. But think of what was behind those monuments, right? Or even what was behind what when you don't find a monument, which which is very meaningful sometimes. Uh, so mm, 
what can we add now? Mm. So aside from the destruction, because I didn't end the phrase, the real problem, like we started with the most trivial, we end with the most important, is that such destructions prospected the existence of an irrecognizable and non-rational world. Right? Why is Bernard insisting so much on this kind of surreal figures like you hear aside from the centauri that maybe is yeah yeah it's from the, the the classical mythology but you know think about this other you know monstrous bodies that do not seem to to, to correspond to anything real for real is that uh, he, here it basically means that uh, Bernard as some you know most cultured and enlightened people of this time was starting realizing that there is a recognizable world and that God has entrusted to man to be investigated through by reason because by understanding the world you can understand not God to the fullest but you can get close to it somewhat close to it then, then. so you know figures of objects that didn't exist in reality basically divert the Christian mind from what is real that is from the creation right and th this is interesting because you can see behind this also the refusal of superstition and this is also an important step in the history of Western civilization like if you uh, hear Bernard is not saying ah these monsters shouldn't appear because they are Satan's flag and people will stick to Satan because they, they like more these figures than uh, they're more entertaining N no this is not the point the point here is that you shouldn't be concerned about something that does not exist in fact, even in the in the purest and deepest and earliest Christian uh, religion, actually, there is no real hell. For example, um, hell is considered as a non-place. It's basically the lack of heaven. So it's darkness. It's emptiness. It's not like a place where, like Romanesque architecture, right, had portrayed to scare the believers. Like that is a place with flames. There are the monsters that eat you alive and all this stuff. Because that was something that, you know, I the pagans believed in. So, actually here there is a deep realization within the Christian mindset that there is something that goes beyond the triviality and the monstrosity of, of fear and irrationality. Th this, is a this is a hymn to reason. Like, this thing would evolve into scholastics with the adoption of Aristotelianism. Hence, Christianity that gives itself not a much an emotional face, but rather a rational one, and this is a hell of a difference. Like that—that's the difference in a nutshell between Romanesque and and Gothic uh, art, and 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 all the philosophy that revolved around. So, it it's of extreme importance because it brings light, brings reason. It, it brings light for real in the sense that Gothic cathedrals were, were conceived in order to do this, like to reflect l light. Um, the Romanesque building was closed inside, light didn't uh, didn't pour from, from the windows, right? The Gothic cathedral is something else, is, is the realization that there is something so great, uh, so luminous, so so clear, so limpid, that, that is God. Right, that that anything that can that confuses you, that brings darkness, that brings this kind of monstrous pictures that have no sense, no harmony, no no rea no realism behind them, is evil, is bad. It's it's not uh, what a Christian should be concerned of. This is the real meaning behind uh, the apologia, right? Um. So, essentially exactly because governed by a divine law that according to Bernard is known and practicable, practicable by men thanks to revelation of course the real world doesn't have to contain accidents 
Salvation is achievable by man if he does not renounce to the rational control of himself. So the coincidence between life and rationality is faithfully reflected in the choices relatively to architecture, right? The Bernardinische Grundtypus, the, the Bernardin plan of, uh, of churches and uh, plan of churches and the uh, Cistercian monastic complexes is in fact um, a design of essentially um, of essential and geometric simplicity it's functional it's repetitive if you want but also for those practical reasons that we were talking about before is easily, easily and rapidly uh, applicable right so it's a uh, it's a it's part of a great rationalization that objectively during the 12th century take pl it takes place in Europe it does happen it's a real thing it doesn't it's not an exaggeration it passes through these things as well so as you understand Bernard was not just a rationalist and a reformer but um, you know proving what how complex his personality was he was also great mystics right his comment so mysticism seen still within a, a rational order that this is important as well right his comment on the song of songs for example in the celebration of the character of the virgin that is the uh, you know christian f female um, symbol and archetype announces and already fuels what would become a you know guiding line uh, dominating guiding line into gothic spirituality you know the figure of mary is prominent in this in, in this i would say the virgin is uh, mary is the perhaps more rightfully celebrated um, symbol of the goodness of human reason like especially uh, the virgin w with her child is in this sense the the greatest emblem of humanity that we have produced in especially in western civilization i mean I the celebration of a mother with a child like if you want a civilization to be really about something you look at what the gothic was look at what the virgin represents in this box that's pure life beauty and love this is our hymn if you think about it so when you think about christianity what do you think about you know this the, the, even in history of um, of art in this case because that's what we're talking about just look at what it means right because i think especially young people don't know anything about this like they they, they presume it's i mean young people i'm young myself but maybe not so young anymore <laughs> at one point and um, you know the, the, there is a problem about this all there is a problem about disorientation. You know, Bernard might have been right that today we're we're actually wired to extremely stupid, like a trivial things. Like, think about, I don't know, what do you think ninety five percent of people does with a smartphone every time you you see them glued in the screen? You think they are actually reading Bernard of Clairvaux, <laughs> or they are, you know, they're resolving a, you know, a differential equation, or um, I don't know, they're doing something really productive for human civilization with a great... No, they're just jerking around. Like, that there's not many other ways to put it, to be honest. And and the problem is ignorance. The problem is this disorientation, is looking at things, not because you're actually evil, because you're doing something really evil, but b b because you're actually lacking, rather lacking the, the awareness of what is really important. And it is a real problem now. I am personally very deeply convinced of this, and that's why also, independently from your spiritual beliefs, I do think that studying things like this, like medieval art, uh, can give you, can reveal you so much. Telling the truth, it's not anecdotal. This is a real thing. Um, I, I've, I've rarely been trying to to say these things on on Schwerpunkt, like first of all because. We, we didn't talk about art that much. I created um, history of 
art history playlist that because every once in a while you gotta t talk about art as well um, up to this time it was actually all militarily oriented because there is a, a, an immense amount of beauty and civilization that we have produced thanks to war right and this is also another thing that people today don't understand every time they they, they think about war that they, they think that you know the boogeyman arrive right and um, our civilization was was forged in war like basically every the one of every other you know the, the whole human civilization evolved through these things as well right but maybe I don't know if you're interested in history of art I, I could make videos about that and um, and I think it could be useful as well because th there is in fact a history of art it's not just looking at pictures that is also nice but uh, also meaning behind that right and and this is what I would like to stress now for example during the uh, you know the figure of the Virgin that we discuss especially during the 12th and even more the 12th the 13th and 14th century it assumes an enormous importance the figure of the the, the Virgin actually assumes a um, a new an un you know unprecedented importance let's, let's think about all the great glasses of the portals um, sculpted into the French cathedrals or the um, Romanesque um, absence where she uh, she figures either alone or next to Christ and that is uh, that she you know being cry uh, crowned by him and also to him uh, a community into the royal dignity you know the, the as queen of the s of the half heaven right um, but especially as mother and mediatrix let's say at, at the sun side right and these are shades that the mark actually a, a change on a theological level but also a great you know mm, sweetness and emotivity that were inconceivable before the year 1000 like there was an emotional side we've seen before but it was kind of a of dark it was fe fear was the prevalent feeling but in here instead the reevaluation and the and even the exaltation of the role of the virgin are to be linked uh, i i believe rightfully to the new attention towards the woman this is a new attention towards the woman in art in literature right this starts already during the 12th century and we will see it uh, most evidently under uh, into during the the new uh, European poetic civilization in, in the uh, chanson and, and the uh, troubadour uh, uh, poetry and also in Italy with the ever stronger uh, movement in the 13th century of the Dolce Stil Novo for example into which uh, Guido Cavalcanti and Dante Alighieri would invent their own characters of idealized women and from which also would emerge um, Beatrice for example for Dante or Laura for for Petrarch but in there we are in fact in 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 humanism but uh, th this is a, a humanist branch that has started from the 12th century and it definitely did pass a lot through through the Virgin and of course the Virgin uh, is also a symbol of, uh, of femininity that actually stems from much before. Like you, you can't deny that in the Christian Virgin, uh, there is, um, you know, the great Mother Goddess of the Neolithic, um, you know, agriculture civilization. I mean, there the is from the great this great sensitivity was strong, especially in the Mediterranean, this great agrarian female figures like, but also in the north. Right. Also, for other reasons that we explained, for example, just the other day about that video about um, the Chrétien de Trois uh, Cliché, about the tournaments. That uh, if you search Chrétien de Trois Schwerpunkt or the title, ah, here, Honor, Glory, and Passion: The Tournament in Chrétien de Trois Cliché. Right. In, in there, you f you find that also a bit of nightly psychology about wh what women represented f for those men and, uh, and how how powerful their symbolism actually was in, in that by the way radically violent society 
right? This safe harbor, this, this, this heavenly picture of the woman that starts being developed in exactly in those centuries. And it's not a coincidence, right? The development of, of feudalism in these centuries as well is tied even to certain roles and views, etc. Then there are ideals, of course, there are ideals, but th they're, they're still meaningfully expressed and celebrated at that time. And that is important as well, right? Uh, if you, you don't have to, to come very close to, to see that civilization always celebrated women, right? It's not now that we are allegedly, you know, ending oppression of, you know, look at what these medieval Christians did and look at what the woman represented for them. And uh, and then we can talk about that as well. So, all right. Um, there is naturally a lot, there would be actually a lot to tell, but uh, I think we can stop here for now. And I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.